This is Justice, History, and the Law. Lectures, discussions, and interviews from the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York. Today we present an interview with Judge Rod Jui, the head judge of the Saddam Hussein trial. The executive director of the Robert H. Jackson Center, Greg Peterson, is the interviewer. As you were really preparing and the trial had not started at that point, your job had pretty much wound up as an investigative law judge. What was kind of running through your mind? The mission is a huge mission. You have to work over over 35 years documents, mass grave, witnesses. So, frankly, if I told you, I don't have time to think about myself because I have to prepare each single word. I know exactly this court, it's domestic court, but it has to reach the international standard. The first thing, I set up all the department because my mission as a chief investigative judge, I have to do this. Department of the mass grave, department of the documents, 24 investigative judges, you know, legal assistant, and investigator, other, other, a lot of stuff. It's around 900 individuals working this mission, you know, behind the scene, no one can see them, you know. So we went over each single word and document just to like to bring the rule of law to Iraq. Most of Iraqi people, when they talk about the rule of law, they think Hammurabi. Hammurabi is Iraqi, 30, you know, 3,000 years ago, the first court there. So then they missed the rule of law. 2003, it's the best opportunity to bring the rule of law back to Iraq. So our mission, we thought this is our duty as a judges, to bring the rule of law back to our society. So the society can feel the rule of law again. If you think, you are United States, living in United States here, Maybe some of you have some experience about the Middle East, some not. But in the Middle East, it's impossible, almost impossible, to bring the head of the state to the justice. Because they think no one can reach them. This is the first time to send a message for each person in the society and over the Arab countries. The head, the head of the state is not out of order. He is under the rule of law. So this is our mission that time, how to bring the rule of law back to Iraq. When you, where did you, where were you born? I was born in Baghdad. You were born in Baghdad? Yeah. And during that time period, what was the, what was the rule and what was the rule of law during that time when you were growing up? By the way, I was born during Saddam's regime. When Saddam in power, I was born, you know. So when I raised, Saddam in position. Saddam set up two things. He set up, for the, I'm talking about the judicial issues and the legal system, not other issues. Set up judicial system for himself and the regular judicial system. Regular judicial system involved with family laws, contract tort, regular you know, crimes. And the special system, it's connected with each politics crime. So, this special system, the one-shot trial, and the judges there, most of the judges in this system, they are not judges. They have legal background or military background, and they admitted and appointed as a judges. And the court, running by the security or intelligence department, or minister of interior, or special forces, whatever, and general security office, this is. So, I raised in this area, you know. If you have to live safely, you have to be sure, don't talk about the politics. And don't look to the president of the state as a regular person. You have to look at him as a person over the law. Yeah. You, when you went to law school, Saddam was still in power. Yep. And what were your professors teaching you about the relationship between 
the president, Saddam Hussein, and the judiciary. I know you talked about the fact the president's over and you don't really have any control over him. Like we here have a balance, checks and balances between our judiciary and our executive and legislature. That apparently didn't happen in Iraq. Before I mention this, I, I want to tell you some small story here. By the way, education in Iraq is free, but depend on the grade you get. If you get high grade, you get free education. You know, I get this opportunity. And uh, the school of law in, in, in humanitarian department, because in high school we have a humanitarian and science. If you go science, you go doctor and engineer and whatever. If you go humanitarian, law school, economic and teaching. I went to humanitarian. And I admitted by law school and other some you know, colleges. My father told me when I, I told him, I'm going to the law school. He said, look, this tough job. If you be responsible for the law, go. If you will make me proud, go. If not, pick another school. I said, I will do. I will do my best. Then we study Saddam. We study, we called, you know, it says, um, we study Saddam's knowledge in law school and even in judicial institute, mm -hmm. you know. So Saddam, each year, he published, you know, not articles, but speech related to law, related to science, related to anything. And if you are in this area of law, you have to study this and you have to pass exam in this. So, and Saddam has very unique word. He's, one day he said, I make the law. I can write it and I can erase it. And he did, because he, as the chief of, as a head of the state, he has this power under the Iraq constitution. So that's what our professor teach us. Saddam is mean part of law or law sometimes. I know just using the uh, German Nazi time period, most everything that Hitler did was legal because of the Reichstag, which was their legislative, authorized him to create law. So when he gave out an order, it was had the force of law. Is this sort of a similar situation? I think Saddam studies Hitler, Stalin, you know, charisma. Both of them. Then he divide his personality with this kind of charisma. If, he study and read a lot of about Stalin, but maybe Hitler is not. Yeah, so he try to legalize everything. For that reason, he set up, you know, the Revolution Court. The Revolution Court. If you go to the process of the Revolution Court. If someone arrested for the politics issues and he went to a revolution court, he has one chance, just the trial, one shot. And if he get life sentence, he's so lucky because 90% of the verdict is death penalty. So this court, Saddam did not do anything. The guy arrested by the security people. And the security people did the investigation. And they referred the guy to the court. And the court executed him. So he's out of business. However, how this running? It's running by people understand what Saddam's want. Yeah. And we study all this. For that reason, I come back to the first question. How Daesh and why Daesh is important for Iraqis? Mm -hmm. Because we'll change all this. We'll let people understand. No way. There is no revolution court anymore. There is rule of law anymore. And no one can get out of responsibility if he did anything wrong. You were appointed the chief investigative judge for the Iraqi High Tribunal. And in that role, your job was really to review evidence, find evidence. The prosecutor seemingly would present evidence to you, and you'd sort of review it. Uh, what other role did you have in the form of chief, chief investigative judge? By the way, I appointed as a judge in this court, and I elected by my colleagues as a chief investigative okay. judge. Yeah, because the, the position should be elected by the, your colleagues as a judges. 
Yeah, it's um, your position as the chief investigative judge. You are responsible to review all the cases, you know, and you have to, you know, appoint judges, investigative judges, working each one or two or three for certain case. That's one. Also, what I did, I wrote the draft of the rule of evidence for the Iraq High Tribunal, which is. Uh, you know, uh, uh, apply later, and the, it's made part of the Iraqi law by the Iraqi parliament. And I it says, uh, get all this rule of evidence from the you know Yugoslavia tribunal. Then I mix it with the Iraqi criminal procedure law, so it's become fit with the, our system. This is two things. The third. I do my, my mission as investigative judge also. So I did investigation in both cases, the jail and the Anfal. You know, the Anfal, it is, is uh, maybe one of the biggest crimes in Iraq is during 1987, 1988. So this is the mission. One, investigative judge as a judge. Second, chief, you know, administrative work, review all the cases, go over the documents, which is 21 tons documents we had there, and massive graves, you know, it's all the facilities there. Then, 2005, uh, the Iraqi High Tribunal statute changed, and the law mentioned, required the spokesman should be judge, and the president of the court appoint me as a spokesman. So he put another responsibility on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So almost this is so media, you know, legal and administrative stuff. Lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. As you started your job in the investigative role of looking at the evidence, I know that you were able to have access to many documents, which came from Saddam's. Uh, offices and palace, but you also went out and had to go to sites like we saw in the movie here. Mm -hmm. How did that affect you? Let me be honest with you. If you go to the Massy Grave area, it affects you, yes. But when you go to the villages, when you survive the people there, when people already arrested and should be executed, but they lucky enough and still alive. When they told you the story, it's the biggest shot here. It's really affect a lot. So we stopped the investigation a lot because the stories is so hard. When you listen to to young girl, she arrested with her mom and you know siblings, and then they execute her family in front of her, and she explained that to you, and she crying. She crying, and you cannot, you are a person. You are a judge, yes, but you are a human being. Many times I ordered my team to stop the investigation because stories affect us, we have to stop. Otherwise we will go, we will miss the rule. To be judge, you have to be fair. That you have two things. You have victim and you have accused. You have to be balanced between them. So we stop a lot of sessions. Not just that, if you listen to old guy who lost 13 members of his family, you know, sons and grandchildren, it's affect a lot. This is the biggest stories. And we spend month of month between mountains and desert and places, interview people there. Because we interview, I did not answer Dan Sinor about the interview because it was secret until that time, but we interviewed 10,000 individuals. 10,000, not by myself, all team. We are 900 individual working. Yes, we have around 400 for protection and security, but 600 in field working. Yeah. You mentioned you talked about security. Did you feel at risk? You know, Greg, I'm a judge during Saddam's regime. You know, when Saddam's the president, I was judge. I'm, I still keep my position. 
When I decide to be a judge, I understand there is danger, there is risk. Maybe it's not high than the Saddam's case, but always there is danger. And always I have to remember I have a duty to do it. If I look about the security and safety, I cannot be fair judge in my, in my chamber. When I do my job, I do my job. That's it. And I believe in something. I don't know if I'm going to, to stay tomorrow or not. So I live in my moment. I have to make my decision accurately, fairly, and I have make my decision when I make sure it is the right decision to make it. Before Saddam, I investigate Muqtada al-Sadr. Muqtada al-Sadr now is you know, considered one of the Iraqi's leaders, and he, he still wanted. I arrest, I you know, issue arrest warrant against him in 2003 for murder case. Muqtada al-Sadr has a militia until this minute, control most of the south and Baghdad. So as a judge, I have to do it. No way. Otherwise, I have to leave my chamber, find another job. Did you move your family into the green zone? Um, 2004, after, after my home is attacked in Baghdad, because I, I lost two homes, you know, I moved my family. Yeah. You, as the chief investigative law judge, gathered the evidence you worked on the indictment. And then the day comes, we saw a little bit, where you're given the responsibility to have the president, former president of Iraq, come into the chamber, and it's just basically you and him. What's going on? What's going on in your mind? <laughs> I was driving this morning my car from my home to my chamber. And I was turning the radio on. And there is rumor said Saddam will, will they, they will bring Saddam to court. And one guy said, that's impossible. No one can bring Saddam to the court. And other one guy, other person guy said in the radio, he said, you know, I don't think there is person can sit face to face to Saddam. This kind of feeling in, inside Iraqi minds should be changed. Should be changed. When they ask me to do this mission, I don't have enough time to, you know, to prepare everything. I don't have months of months of months. No, I have limited time to do it. So I can't tell you, frankly, sometimes I miss myself. Because working around 16 hours a day, gathering documents. Then my team asked me the same question. I said, Judge Rod, you are going to face this guy next few days. What do you think? I said, look, look at him as a regular, you know, perpetrator. Don't look at him as a Saddam or something like that. If you put this in your mind, you will be out of mission. You cannot do it. Put him in his cage and work with him as accused. Give him his right, teach him how he's respond, let him know there is rule of law and there is judge and court. Otherwise, you cannot do it. Forget he's a president. He's accused, he's under the law. That's it. And you, each one of you, you prosecute a lot of people. And this guy, just, just another number added to your list. Don't think about other issues. I cannot ignore Saddam, but if I put Saddam in high position, maybe I cannot you know, control him 100%. So I put him in his right position, as accused, that's it. I did not look at him as a president or something like that. I look at him as accused in front of me like other one. Still, he's looking at you. <laughs> And you're looking at him. Definitely. And we just saw that, I mean, he's got these eyes that just sort of, did, did, it wasn't that simple. Let me tell you something about, this is something secret. Okay. One, <laughs> keep, keep the camera on. 
In one session, because we spent a lot of session with Saddam. In one session, eye to eye, more than two minutes, no one moved his eyes. You know, until, you know, because there is very hard topic discussion, and we ask, and he answer, ask, answer, and we ask in sensitive question, and he got it. Then he stuck, and we stuck. I said, you have to answer it. Otherwise, you can't keep your, because you waive your, your right to, to, you know, because you, you waive your right to remain silent. You know, in the beginning, I gave you a right. You can remain silent or not? He said, he said no, I will talk. I said, you have to answer the question. And two minutes, eye to eye. <laughs> <laughs> then answer. <laughs> So the, the actual indictment, of which, again, we just saw a piece of, it lasted for a few days. Oh, yeah. It's, it's in the beginning, we, first day, it just first hearing the right, the right of, you know, all the rights. Mm -hmm. but, you know, then when we get the defense counsel for them, we start the sessions. Mm -hmm. um, and we took it, we start in 2004, yeah, until 2006, but we finished with Saddam in mid of 2005. Yeah. Yeah. And you had to do the same thing for the other six defendants as well? Did you read the indictments, the Chemical Alley and... and, and Seven in the jail, six in the Lamphal, okay. and um, more in 1991. Okay. It's 11 in 1991. And yeah, same, we did same, everything. Yeah. Yeah. When you re got done with that in indictment process, what was your next role? What, what, what was the, the, your role in this? Um, when you've done the investigation from the E to Z, you have to gather all the evidence, the prosecutor's evidence, the victim evidence, the accused evidence, defense counsel evidence, you know, and your, your investigator's evidence, you gather all the evidence you have to close the investigation session and reread it all and go over each single you know, word and document. And sometimes you find there is lake and there is some, some information you miss it. So you can't open the investigation again to fill this gap. Mm -hmm. If you find the investigation is done, you have to make the final decision. Is there enough evidence against this accused to refer him to the trial or not? If there is enough evidence, you have to refer them to the trial. Sorry, according to the Iraqi criminal procedure law. If not, you have to release him. Yeah. So when we done, we went over all the documents and the process, and we found Saddam. It's um, there is enough evidence to charge Saddam in crime against humanity in the jail. So we charge him and refer him with other seven to the jail, and we found enough evidence against Saddam to charge him in, in uh, genocide in Al-Anfal, so we refer him to trial on the Al-Anfal case also. But we released other cues, because people know the cues who went to the trial, but before the trial, maybe there is 10 cues, 11 cues, and we released some of them. In the jail, uh, in the beginning, we have 10. We release two from them. And we refer, no, we release three, we refer seven. Six of them indicted and one release. Yeah. I guess for our purposes it's in the United States, it sounds like you were part of the, like, as if you went to a grand jury, and then the, the grand jury decided it, there was enough evidence to in, indict, which in turn would be Move, given to the prosecution. It's a close. It's a close to that. It's a, a but you have responsibility, much responsibility, because you have expert witnesses, and we have lay witnesses, and victims, cues, and you have interview all of them. So you, so you see a lot more evidence early on. Yeah. All the process in the trial, yeah. you, all the process you see in the trial, it's same in the investigation, okay. and sometimes more than that, because you build the case from the beginning until the end. And the trial work, just they go over your work. So sometimes, if the witness cannot show up in the trial, 
the trial judges did not dismiss this uh, testimony. They will look at it and take it as the investigative judge signed it. If the investigative signed this document, they will accept it. So all the process in trial, it's same in the investigation, except we did not send people to jail for or death penalty, you know, because we believe this is second chance to the accused. We, first chance he, he lost in the investigation, we give him second chance, you know. Maybe he get new information, new evidence, a new document, he can release himself. So second chance in the trial. However, the investigative judge can make verdict in some cases, you know, so can sentence people. But in capital uh, penalties like, you know, this cases, no. Investigative judge is one guy, but the panel is five judges. It's good opportunity for the accused to defend himself in front of five judges than one judge. And we believe in five, five brands better than one brand, you know. So as investigative judge said, okay, you lost your case in front of me, but you have another chance. 99% he will lose second chance, but still there is 1% he can get it. Yeah. And sometimes it's happened. A lot's happened. We noticed that when it went to trial, uh, early on, at least only one of the judges permitted himself to be filmed mm -hmm. because it's for security reasons. You permitted yourself to be filmed during the in reading of the indictment. Was that a hard decision for you? Uh, that's back me to my, my father. I remember that exactly. And um, I told him, as, um, I, wasn't, I was judge in, in Central Criminal Court of Iraq before I became a judge in this court. And they appointed me to be judge there. Um, I know the responsibility is big, and I told my father. He uh, said, I'm going to take another position with my siblings. So he said, do it. I said, no, it is uh, not a matter of do it. I'm thinking about your security, not my security. He said, don't think about our security. As I told you from the beginning, a few years ago, which is not a few years ago, actually, it's more than, you know, this is a ten, a 20 years ago. <laughs> if, you are, if you can make your duty, do it. This is your duty. Security, don't worry about it. It's not easy, but it's very important to let people believe especially in Iraq. I believe there is still there is rule of law and still there is judges can you know, do their duty and prosecute who they think it's commits a crime against Iraqi people. Yeah, it is not easy decision, but it, uh, I, when I did it, I'm in full, you know, full free and full responsibility. Yeah, it's, it's important to do it. What was, when that occurred, did you get any feedback? You, you really exposed yourself. You did put a target on your back. And what, what kind of <laughs> feedback did you get? What do you mean by the feedback? For the security or? Well, the... well you're, they're seeing the whole Iraqi <laughs> world. Uh, the world is seeing you. Indict Saddam Hussein. Did, did people call you and say, what are you, nuts? By the way, we don't have cell, you know, cell phone that time in Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a. Uh, we communicate sometimes if you have, you know, home phone, this is okay. That's enough for us at that time. <laughs> we don't have cell phone. This is connect for the security, not security of, of people, no, security of the government. They did not allow the cell phone. Anyway, yeah, it is, there is two reactions. One, people say we are proud of you. And there is a lot of a story about these issues because there is a lot of volunteers went to my father's home just for the offer they can help and protect. And another also, there is a reaction for people preparing to assassinate me. You know, so it's both reactions. But people think this is the first health step for future of Iraq. And really, a lot of people appreciate this, this point and this moment. And by the way, my oldest son has no idea I will, I will going to do this mission. 
So when he saw me in the TV, he has no idea. And he's looked at this and he told to his mom, 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 my father on TV. And my wife said, what he's doing on TV? He said, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I just, you did a very brave thing in for, to advance the rule of law. And I'm just for a second going to pause it and give you a hand. I mean, that's just amazing. Because you need to know that during the first trial, the Dujal, Dujal, Dujal? Dujal, yeah. Dujal trial, three of the defense counsel for Saddam Hussein and the other six defendants were assassinated. Yeah. And it was quite a process uh, where they sought security and, and with the, from the judges uh, and ultimately got some protection. But it was a very, very dangerous time for judges who clearly, some of them didn't want their faces to be seen on television. Uh, and the defense counsel, and that was very, uh, very tame. So for what you did, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, By the way, also, we kept many stories a secret because we like to move forward with the rule of law, not just the defense counsel. The judges also assassinate. I lost one of my team. He assassinated. But, and a lot of, you know, investigator and legal assistant. But I was kept all this information secret because I don't like to affect my team and other people to stop missions. I remember you know, one of my best judges assassinated in the middle of Baghdad. You know, this is, and, um, yeah, and I told my team that time, said, look, that's expected. When we accept this mission, we know someone will kill us. But we have two choices. Now told me. Are you going to continue with me or you quit? If you are going to continue with me, let's continue. These bad guys, you know, let's send them to jail. And a lot of people stay with me, you know, until this mission. I'm here in the United States and they will continue there. They are proud and they are heroes there, frankly. You know, they fighting and for justice, rule of law. It's not easy work to do. But they did it. At the end of World War II in Germany, there was a process known as denazification. Yeah. And throughout the process of interviews to see folks who were involved in the party politics and how far they were involved in party politics, you were involved in a process of debathification. Yep. Talk about that. <laughs> um, let me put some get some light in, in this area before I talk about the debathification. In Iraq, Saddam has a strategy for everything. One of his strategy, he has to make everybody, everybody Ba'athist in Iraq. So Ba'ath party required from the sixth grade. If you are in sixth grade, you have to sign documents, you are a member of Ba'ath party. When I graduated from the law school, I applied for the master degree there, and I passed all the exams. But I did not admit it, because I'm not a high rank member of the Ba'ath Party. In Judicial Institute, when I applied to Judicial Institute, it's required to be Ba'athist. Otherwise, you cannot get your seat. Even you pass all the you know, required exams, you fill all the you know, it's requirement conditions, you have to be Ba'athist. And this is required. There is two kinds of Ba'athists in Iraq. People record or put their name in the Ba'ath party record to continue their life there and get position and continue studies or something like that. And there is Ba'athists who believe in the Ba'ath ideology. 2003, or the CPI Order 1, Established the Bathification Committee. The goal on the role of the Debathification Committee, sorry, it's a, to work over three ranks of Bathists, you know, which almost 90% of Bathists not reach these three ranks. 
because it's high ranks. Including me, I cannot reach this ranks. 2003, 2004, there is no problem. Because the bathification committee working according to the rule of this committee. 2005, when the election, the first election in Iraq, you know, which is important, took, took opportunity, the politics control the debathification department. Control 100%. And they start to make a deal with some professional people. Working, following this process, you are OK out of this uh, process, of the debathification process. If not, you have three choices. One, quit and leave. Second, maybe depend on your position and the question on your request you get. And if you remember 2005, 2006, it's a huge chaos in Iraq. If you said no, maybe somebody will kidnapping you. Otherwise, if you said not, you are Baathist and they will fire you. If you are from your position. If, if they fire you, just imagine this. They did not ask a regular person to do something. Definitely they asked someone in position to do some rule. And this guy, if they fired from his position, that's look like, you know, death penalty decision. Because you will lose all the protection you have and you will start the regular life. So it's easy for anyone to assassinate you or kill you on the street. 2005, 2006, that's it. 2005, I'm involved in debathification. And I remember that story. It's just one person called me, said, sir, it's, um, your name is on the list for the you know, debathification. I said, yeah, let them do it. Why not? I said, what? He said, look, this is Paul. <laughs> We were involved in this mission more than one year ago now. And we went to the TV, and we have almost finished the investigation. And later, sorry for this word. I said this exactly, quote. Later, some kids come in to say debathification. Let them go. I have access for some phone calls. I get my phone. I call somebody. I said, look, you have two things. One, let us work. Second, I will go to the media right now. Bye. So, they start to use debathification as a tool to, let's see this, if someone say no, move him from this position. That's not my speech. It is one of the director in the debathification committee. He is, did interview in 2006, and he said that. He said, debathification used as a tool by the politics parties. And they use it exactly when they need it. And they leave it when they don't need it. So the process, it's missed. And the goal of the debathification committee is missed also. The goal of the debathification committee to restore the Iraqi society again. And the ideology of the Baathist, not the debathification for the people. You know, if you are talking about the Baathist people in Iraq, which means you are talking about all the young people and old people. Because as I said, from sixth grade until, you know, maybe 60 years or something like that. So if we're talking about the bad case people, that's wrong. You destroy the society. 2003, it's tearing point in Iraqi society. So we have to think about the reconciliation, restore the society, rebuild the society, and Let's say this also. Re-educate our people. Not destroy the society and say, you are Baathist, you are Shia, you are Shia. No. But it's happened. And it, until this minute, if someone followed the process in Iraq, last election, this election a few days ago, and we wait for the result tomorrow, you know, they you know, remove 511 individuals from the uh, from 511 candidates from the election because they say they are cooperate with the Baathists. 
Frankly, some of them yes, but most of them not. Yeah, so I involve, I involve a lot. People, politics have some agenda, and they sometimes try to use the legal on the rule of law to pass their agenda. So when my team and I start to stop them, second day we found we are Baptist. You know, but if someone follow the agenda, he's not Baptist. Yeah, but at least in the end, we win. Yeah, even they tried, but we win. Yeah. Judge is it Judge Rockman? Rock, Rockman. Rauf Rahman. Rahman yeah. 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 Came in and sort of created a little. You've concluded that trial as the chief judge, and ultimately, Hussein was convicted. And then there was an appeal. Yes. And during the appeal process, Anfar started. Anfar trial started. Between, between, Al Anfar started in August 2006. And the verdict of the jail, it's in November 5th, 2006. So during the jail, Al Anfar started. Then the appeal was denied, and things start happening. Yeah. For refresh everybody's recollection, what happened now that the first trial had concluded, the appeal had been uh, denied, and now there's a whole lot of politics going on with just the transfer of Saddam Hussein, and, and how to deal with that whole issue. Were you part of that at all? I'm not, I'm, you know, I cannot say yes, I can say not no. It's not legally, maybe for advising. Because when the appeal denied, the responsibility of the court is done. It's a three stage process, investigation, trial, and appeal. When the appeal chamber put his signature, you know, the judges sign, we are out of business anymore. However, maybe they exchange ideas with us. When the appeal sign and you know deny the, the appeal, they send the file to the prime minister office. If there is death penalty, if there is no death penalty, they will send the file to the minister of justice and put the guy in jail. You know who is convicted. But for the death penalty, they send the file to the prime minister office. So it's executive a process. It's not judicial process. However, the execution committee, there is execution called execution committee. The head of the execution committee is judge, should be judge, or must be judge. No. And there is a prosecutor also, uh, doctor, Representative from Minister of Interior, representative from Minister of Justice, and clerk, depend on the, the religion of the a person who's convicted. If he's Muslim, they bring Muslim clerk, Jewish, Jewish, Christian, Christian, however. So this is the committee. The head of the committee is the judge. So they exchange ideas with us for this. It's politics, executive process. However, this process must be follow the criminal procedure law. It's not open. Now, there is rule for the execution. And the rule, it's in criminal procedure law, Article 280 until, until 292. Yeah. Should be followed exactly. Yeah. Were you worried that the Anfar case, which had just been started, which was probably the, with the genocide, with, with the, the extreme crimes against humanity, that having the sentence of execution completed would take away from the world's interest in that case? The law is the law. The guy convicted in one crime, whatever, 
killed one person or 10,000 person. This is the law. And we are working in this area. So Saddam's convicted in the jail. I understood when he convicted, he will face the death penalty any time. And maybe he executed in the beginning of the jail, in the middle of the jail, or they, they remain him until the end of other cases, the jail or Halabcha or others, you know, depend. I, and we have to respect the law. This is the process. We don't have any doubt in these issues. But also, the Amphal is a big case. It's, it's good to keep all the cues, all the cues to defend themselves in their case. And we are a legal community. If someone die before find him guilty, he will consider as an innocent. And the biggest example for this, Milosevic case. Milosevic died during the trial. He did not convict it. Then he died. Legally, even you have tons of documents, as a judges, we consider him as innocent person because we did not sign the verdict. This is, this point did not affect judges. This point affect the victim's right. Yes, Saddam is convicted and find guilty in one case, and that's enough. But in each case, let's go outside now, and one guy took your wallet. You know? Then you catch him and went home to the court. Then he has sickness and died. This is affect your something in your side. Because you said, look, I did not get my verdict yet. We are talking about 300,000 people die in 1991. And 180,000 people die in Amphal. And 5,000 Halabcha. So it's not affect the justice exactly. Because justice is justice. The rule of law is rule of law. Saddam is found guilty in the jail, and that's enough but it's affect the right of victims to support their, their, uh, their cases. It's good to find Saddam's guilt in one case, better than he die before the, any case, <laughs> you know? Because otherwise he will consider maybe innocent for all cases. And this is, some scholars don't focus about this area, but I think, this is my personal opinion, it's important and part of justice to let both parties participate and the victim support his case and the accused defending case and the judges you know tell their word in the end otherwise you know you will miss one part execute the bad guy but what the others they have a right people in the jail get their right but there is people in Anfal, people in Halabcha, people and Saddam also has a right to defend himself Maybe Saddam, he's innocent in Halabcha. Maybe he's innocent in 1991. No one knows. Unless the evidence talk. We have expression in Iraqi, you know, it's an Iraqi criminal um, procedure. We said, as a judges, we don't talk. The evidence is talk. Yeah. So this is my theory about the jail and the Lamphal. Hussein, during the Dujal case, at one point shocked everybody stood up when they were talking about presenting various orders and whether he had signed them and said, I signed them. Blame me, don't blame these guys. When you saw that on television, what was your reaction to this? I was lying in my sofa <laughs> <laughs> in my home. <laughs> you know, this is, did not come you know, suddenly and you know, no, this is hard work. We, did, we spent more than one year to let Saddam come in this area. And Saddam understood. He, he did the same thing during the investigation. During the investigation, Saddam tried to defend himself a lot. Then later, he said, I'm responsible for everything. I signed all these orders. I ordered these people to do this and this and that. They follow my order. That's during the investigation. And when it came to the life and in the, in the TV, 
in the trial, it was a great moment because part of the investigation, it's all part of a secret, no one can see it. But when people in the Iraqi society saw this, it's a great minute for justice because people saw when the accused confessed, said, I'm responsible for these crimes. And this is part of the you know, teaching lesson of the Iraqi High Tribunal for the Iraqi society. When we decide to be, you know, televise this trial, because we like to educate our people, what the rule of law means, what the human rights means, what the right of the accused means, what the right of the victims means. So this is one, one of them. So I was very, very happy. You know, frankly, I was lying in my, you know, court. And when he said, said, yes, <laughs> this is the minute. You know, because he's now confessed. The execution occurs in December, right at the end of 2006. Uh, to most observers, it was sort of a, a probably not well orchestrated from uh, the cell phone and all that stuff. Did you being so part of the process and seeing the end finally conclude, Hussein hanged, but you saw the images on the television, what was your reaction? Sometimes when you, when you watch a movie, there is two things stuck in your mind, the introduction and the end. The rest, maybe slightly you remember. We went over very, very good, you know, a process during the trial. Yes, there is some shocking, some lying, some but this is rule of law. This is the law. And we follow it. And Saddam has opportunity to defend himself. He's talked, in the jail itself, he's talked 39 times. And his defense counsel took the opportunity. But the execution, I said before, it's looked like little dust, little dust, you know, on the food or on the something like that. It is not good image to end the, the process of the rule of law. For two reasons. One, it's, and there is some discussion about the day it's allowed to execute person or not on this day. And there is no reason to broadcast this, you know, this minute. It's rough minute. You know, when you hang someone, it's not easy for overseas or even for Iraqi people. We have a new, a new rule to educate ourselves and our people. Yes, still chaos there, a lot of people die there, but we don't need to broadcast picture when we hang someone. Follow the rule of law, hang him, and send, you know, it's his announcement or and his statement said Saddam is hanging and this is his body and send his body to his family according to the law and that's it. You don't need to broadcast that and send people with siphon. Yeah. And I said this is the fault of the judge there, mm -hmm. the head of the the head of the committee. He, if he's allowed to so someone went inside the the process with the siphon, this is his fault because he's the head. I did not involve in this mission. Yeah. Yeah. There is another one, you know, Kali is involved in this mission. We're here in the Robert H. Jackson Center, and we have a lot of distinguished folks in our midst. And Robert H. Jackson, of course, was the chief American prosecutor at the Nuremberg trial, which was the first trial to bring individuals and hold them accountable for crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, so on. That started in 1945, 46 at Nuremberg. And here you were in the middle as the chief investigative law judge of the Saddam Hussein trial in 2004, 2006, and so on. Is there a connection between what happened in Nuremberg and Jackson's work and what you did in your work at the Saddam Hussein trial? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's international justice. This is the international justice. The leader not out of responsibility, the leader under the rule of law. 
So Nuremberg built the base of the just international justice when they prosecute the Nazis. Yes, there is a brother for Nuremberg, no one talk about law, it's Tokyo. No, there is nobody, somebody wrote about Tokyo trials, but it's not popular like Nuremberg. But Nuremberg is the basic fundamental, you know, international standard for the war crime and crime against humanity and something like that. And this, the, the lesson of the Nuremberg, it's the head of the state not has, did not have any immunity or he's not out of responsibility. No, he's responsible for what he did. For, so, sorry, this is the beginning and Iraqi High Tribunal I think it's one of its results. It's international justice to bring head of the state to justice. Yeah, absolutely. It's, there is big bridge between Nuremberg and other trial. Without Nuremberg, we don't have ICTY, we don't have ICTR, we don't have Iraqi High Tribunal because we started from there. Yeah. And yes, maybe we did good job and some we are people thank you you know describe us you know break but frankly people in Nuremberg without them we did not do anything because they start and we just continue I'm going to conclude on that and just say thank you very much ladies and gentlemen Judge Rod G. The Jackson Center is a historical and educational facility dedicated to preserving the legacy of this country lawyer who became Solicitor General, Attorney General, a Justice of the Supreme Court, and served as Chief Prosecutor at the Nuremberg Trials of Nazi war criminals following World War II. To learn more about this program, Robert Jackson, the Jackson Center, and upcoming events, the Jackson Center is located at 305 East 4th Street, Jamestown, New York, and found on the web at www.roberthjackson.org or contacted by telephoning 716-483-6646.